Thank God for the gospel. Thank God for the gospel. The gospel, so when you, when you hear gospel music, when you hear Christian music, it, you're, you're ministering, it's preaching, it's communicating the gospel that speaks and it resonates in our spirit, man. Amen? Amen. I want you to go like this real quick. Take a, act like you're taking a spoon with some medicine. Some medicine that's good for you, but you don't like it. That nasty medicine, but it's good for you. Just put it in your mouth. Amen. And it's good for you. It helps you. It's going to be good for you, but it don't taste good, but it's going to do you good after you receive it. Amen. That's what the Word of God does sometimes, even in areas when we don't, some things we don't, you're like, ugh. But it, it cuts us free. It gets us right. Amen. In, area, in areas of our life. There's a message I preached on, on Wednesday. The Lord said, give it again, but it may come in a different way, but dealing with sin in the camp. And and I've uh, heard a minister do this before. At some time, one time he ministered on, on Wednesday, and then he came back and preached it on a Sunday. He got even greater results on a Sunday than at just as much as he did on a Wednesday, but he was obedient to what the Lord said. So it's not every time that, that, that I do this, but the Lord said, I need to hear this. Amen. Praise the Lord. If you will, uh, there, there is a uh, gentleman I was driving past Wednesday. Uh, we was going uh, down 13th Street, and I saw this church call. It says the Dock, D O C K. And I said, uh, Lord said, turn around. So I turned around and I went over there, and I met this guy, this gentleman. He's originally from Puerto Rico, and uh, a unique gentleman. And uh, him and his wife they just bought the church. And uh, before it even went up on the market, the Lord had blessed them with it for for $160,000. And he just, he just loves the fellowship and wants the fellowship with other people in the body of Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord. Should I use that microphone? Okay. Get the old Holy Ghost microphone. Amen. Amen. Um, but we're going to try to say, get connected with him. I just need to learn him some more and, and uh, see where he's coming from. And he seems like he has a genuine spirit. Just try to fellowship with some others in the body of Christ. Amen. 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 If you will stand with me for the reading of the word. Let's go to Zechariah. Chapter 3, Zechariah chapter 3, verse 6 and 7. And when you're there, say amen. amen. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 6 through 7. Amen. Check it out just a little bit, please. Okay. Amen. I'm going to go ahead and read. And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, say, walk in my ways, walk in my ways. and if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house and shall also keep my courts and I will give you places to walk among these who stand by. Heavenly Father, we, we just come before you right now in the name of your Son, Jesus. We thank you for your word that it would just minister and go forth and do its intended purpose, Lord, that it would just, the word will go forth and have its perfect place in our hearts, Lord God, that it will cut right to the core, that it will, Lord, just do its intended job. Lord, I thank you for conviction. I thank you for restoration. I thank you for deliverance. I thank you for salvation, Lord. Lord, I thank you for healing and deliverance, Lord God, but I, I thank you for your, your word doing its intended job in each and every one of our lives where that need needs met. In the name of Jesus and the church said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
And the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, and he was speaking to Joshua, who was the high priest. Zechariah was the prophet at that time. And this is, this is what was said. The angel of the Lord said, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways, and if you will keep my charge, then you shall also judge my house, and shall also keep my courts, and I will give you places to walk among these who stand by. Now, Joshua was, was a high priest in that time, and Zechariah was, was the prophet. And he spoke, Zechariah spoke what thus saith the Lord, did he not? Zechariah had a, had a commission. But the word protested in this passage of Scripture, in this context right here, the word protested means to solemnly admonish. He admonished him to do these things. He admonished him to walk in the ways of the Lord. He admonished him to, to keep the courts, to walk upright, and to do the things which are pleasing unto God. He admonished him to walk a straight path before God. Because as men and women of God, we are commanded to live upright and holy before the Lord. Amen? He calls us out of darkness into his marvelous light. And he, he saves us by his grace. Amen. Now those sins, amen, they, they've been, we've been translated from darkness into, in, into the light. Amen. Because of the precious blood which he shed at Calvary. Now we've been commissioned. Amen. We, he, he made a new walk. We've been on a different path, but he's given us a new path, a new walk now. And now we can preach righteousness. We can teach holiness. Amen. We can teach the things of God. But it's not in our own strength which, which these things can be accomplished. Amen. And it's only through Christ. But he gave him a charge. See, Zechariah saw this vision. In a vision, the Holy Spirit instructed him to go to Joshua and told him what to do with it. And even though it was written for our benefit, think about that, for our benefit today, he was relating to Joshua then what the Holy Spirit had given him. Likewise, as men and women of God, we have to speak what the Word says. We have to declare and uphold what the Word says. Not our own agenda, not our own thoughts and way of thinking and seeing things, amen, but according to the Word of God, amen. There's some things that the Lord may instruct us in and pass ways that He may direct us, but... Um, even revealed to us but we may not always understand but we have to trust God and where he's trying to lead us and bring us into amen, amen. hallelujah God called not man called but God called preachers or to hear from heaven and preach what thus saith the Lord so that was the charge to Joshua but let's go to 2nd Samuel or 1st Samuel Chapter 2. And let's see what these priests, these priests did. 1 Samuel chapter 2, we're going to look at verse 12 through 17. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12 through 17. Now the sons of Eli were sons of Balao. Say Balao. And they knew not God. They knew not God. Hear that. They knew not God. They were priests, right? But you can have a position in the church and be wearing a mask and still be of the devil because you don't know the Lord. There's people hiding in the church behind masks. They think that they're saved because they have a position, but they don't have no relationship with God. And because they have no relationship with God, their heart is still deceived. God doesn't have their heart. Their heart is not surrendered to the Lord. So therefore, you have some people like this who, who, are, who are not saved. They go to church just to fellowship. You even have some counterfeit preachers behind the pulpit trying to teach what the Word of God says. But really, they're leading the church away from God. 
They're leading them into sin. They're leading them into rebellion. They're leading them in everything opposed to what the word of the Lord says. Some preachers like that. There was this uh, one preacher in uh, Ohio. He had a youth pastor. And uh, at this college campus that they had, uh, he, he, the Lord told him to wake up 1, 2 in the morning, get up, and go see what's going on in the dorms over there. And they weren't co-ed dorms. The young men in one area, the young women in the other area. And there was a person who was supposed to look over that as well. And so he got up, and he went down there to the dorms, and he saw the youth pastor leading these young folks to rebel against God, drinking and, and, and carousing and every ungodly thing under the sun. So those who did throw in their lot and participate in that manner of ungodliness. And he shut the thing down, and he closed up shop. And he took the keys from that youth minister and he says, you're fired right there on the spot. You can't play around with God because you will be exposed if you don't turn from your wickedness. You can't put on masks with God, church. You have to be 100 with God. Or they say 100. 100. Amen. 100. You got to be 100 with God. Say, Lord, let me be real with you. But these, these priests right here, let's read on what they did. Verse 13. And the priest's custom with the sacrifice, I'm sorry, with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in the seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. At that, the flesh hook brought up. The priest took for himself. So whatever that flesh hook caught, that was the portion for the priest. Okay? Reading, reading on. So they did in Shiloh unto all the Israelites that came thither. In other words, everyone who was Israelite, they did this manner of ungodliness too. Verse 15. Also before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man, The sacrifice... The man that sacrificed, give flesh to roast for the priests, for he will have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, let, not, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desire, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young man was very great before the Lord. For men abhorred the offering of the Lord. In other words, they were they, they were reluctant to come and to bring their offering because they knew the priest wasn't going to do right because of the procedures that was necessary to be taking place in the offering. The portions that will be administrated to them and, and back to the priest and the portions that will be administrated and given to the one who brought the offering. They were corrupt in their dealings. They were evil in everything that they have done. Amen? Amen? God is looking for people with a sincere heart who will walk upright before Him. That's why we don't take these positions or, or, or whatever you do for the Lord. Whether you sing unto the Lord, you sing unto Him with a sincere and genuine heart. When you sing before the congregation, you are ministering the Word of God to them. You are ministering to them the Word of God. And you're ministering, as you're ministering to them, you're ministering unto the Lord. You're, you're blessing the name of the Lord. Amen? You're blessing the Lord. You're lifting Him up and exalting His Him in, in the essence of His glory for who He is. But He can't receive praise from someone who is playing around and playing games with Him. It's like stink in His nostrils. He don't want to smell it. Amen? You have to be real with God. I'm not talking about struggling and habitually... You know, living however you want to, thinking that you can just skate by on, on, on grace and make it into heaven. I'm talking about being sincere in your walk and being dedicated before God. That you resolve to live for the Lord no matter what. Amen? That you just, Because God is, is, is tired of playing games with some people. Thank God for His grace. Amen? Thank God for that. But it's grace to live free from sin, to live in the power and, and strength of the Holy Spirit, not to sin and live however we want to. That's not a license to sin. Amen? Amen? Amen. 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 Am I in the right place? Yes, you are. Amen. Praise the Lord. 
So, let's look at verse 22. Now the sons of Eli, I'm sorry, verse 22. Now when Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings by all this people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear you make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord will slay them. And the child Samuel grew on and was in favor, both with the Lord and also with man. But look at, it says, verse 25, it says, that they would not hearken to the voice of their father. They not, would not listen and they would not take heed to what he is trying to say. He's trying to warn them. What is, what, what, what's that famous saying? Warning comes before destruction. Warning comes before destruction. You know, when you, when you hear this, and I share it with the congregation Wednesday, you hear about different preachers who... who uh, such as uh, Earl, as they know, Earl Pope on a nationwide level. Everyone knows who heard about it knows the story. It's no secret. About how he tried to use his position as a pastor and told the, the women in the congregation that if you will do this and do that, then you will receive your blessing and you're being obedient to the man of God. If you will sleep with me, even though they had husbands, even though they, they weren't married, then you will receive a, a blessing. And because they were deceived, he deceived them. And, and they slept with these two preachers, the preacher and his son, who was the associate pastor. And it left them with two black eyes and also being kicked out from the church. And, and another, just for, and the, to go along with the story and, and, and to set the tone for this, a preacher who I know up in years now, um, running around, chasing women, having them, and sleeping with them in the church. Know the man, personally. No one in here knows, knows him. I don't know, I assume. In the 70s. S still, you know, had that cat and spirit on. And, and, and see, God it gives us so long to, you know, he, his mercy, I'm telling you. He wants us to get right with him. You can't play around with, with, with sin and think that you won't get burnt. Because if you play with sin, you will get burnt. Amen? You've been playing with sin is like playing with fire. And when you play with fire, you will get burnt. See, God wants us to be to live a life of repentance, to be real before God. When you come to the Lord, you 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 of course we 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 repent, we we confess our sins, we get right with God. He changes our heart from within. Now the Holy Spirit lives within us, Amen. So therefore, when the Holy Spirit lives and abides within our temple, then we want to live right and have our steps ordered in righteousness and do what's pleasing unto God. We hate it when we get our feet dirty in sin. Lord, forgive me of what I did. Forgive me of what I said. Forgive me of what I thought. Lord, but, but I desire to keep pressing forward and walk upright before you. And, and, and see, when you blow it, when you sin against God, see, a lot of times people think, well, I need to run away from God. That's the time you need to run to him. Don't run from God, run to him. Amen? You should live a life of repentance. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. Not, not of the act uh, of re repenting from the act of sin. Not saying, Lord, come into my heart all over again, make me saved or whatever, because what you're doing, you're putting Christ back on the cross again. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. But let's go on here. And he said, verse 25, let's look at verse 20. Uh, Verse 27. And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father 
when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon my altar to burn incense and wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation and honors thy sons above me to make yourself fat with the cheapest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. He was saying to them, you know, you're up here prospering and, and, and getting, you know, wealthier and misusing the offerings that was made unto me from my people. You use them from the, for the wrong gain and for the wrong intentions. As I said before, playing with sin is like playing with fire. You will get burned. Because blatant disobedience to God's word will bring judgment on you if you don't repent. Some of you don't believe in that word repent. And I hope you do. This message today will either convict you or will make you feel condemned. And if you feel condemned, then you need to check yourself. But if it convicts you, then it should bring repentance so that you can get right with God. Amen? For some of you, it's not for any of you, but you agree with the word because you're on the right track. Amen? But you can't expect to live in sin and habitually rebel against God's word and expect a blessing or to live a blessed life when you live sinfully against God. I know this is a hard word because I look at some of your reactions. But I have to preach the word, amen? amen. Sometimes the word is tough, but it's going to cut and set you free. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I just have to be blunt today. It's not being ugly out of a malicious or a rude spirit, but it's out of love that the man of God preaches and says what he says. Amen? Amen. It's hard to worship God in spirit and in truth and, and without the weight of sin on you. But just to, to feel liberty in your praise when you feel in, when you're in bondage and when you're bound by the enemy. It's hard to praise God like you want to with the weight of sin on your back. All those who think that they're getting by, scot-free and, li and living how they want to, without paying a price for it, is in for a rude awakening. Because there will come a day where you have to stand before God and give an account if you don't settle it right here on this earth with Him. Now, look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. See, you can't afford to compromise, church. You can't afford to compromise. Compromising doesn't get you nowhere with God. God is not a God of compromise. God will never compromise His Word. He'll never change and alter a few things and make a few adjustments so that it, it, things can just be okay with us and be to our liking. But either we will obey and follow all the word, or none of it at all. Amen? As Christians, we love to live by the word and to follow the word. Why? Because the Spirit of God lives and abides within us. We love to do what's up right before God. Because the Spirit of God lives within us. It's not The Bible doesn't teach sinless perfection. No. No. But that sin shall not reign and have dominion over you. Because if you can tell me right now that you'll never have to say, Lord, I'm sorry for anything. Lord, forgive me. From this day on out to the rest of your life, you're lying to yourself. There's no such thing as sinless perfection. You can get mad and just blow up on your wife. You sin. You can tell her stupid and dumb. You sin. So there's no such thing as sinless perfection, but that you can walk in victory over the sin nature. You can walk in victory because of Christ. Your faith in Christ and what he's done for you on that cross. Therefore, now when your faith is kept and left and remained in what Christ did on that cross, your faith is planted and solidly anchored in what he's done for you. Now the Holy Spirit can come in and he can do what he wants to because you get out of the way and you allow God to have his way in you and work through you. Amen? Amen. But some of us, we have to get out of the way and let God do what He wants to do in our lives. Amen? But being knuckleheads, 
will constantly just break us on our face. Break us on our face before God. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1. Go ahead and read that, my brother. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Amen. You which be so spiritual, seek to restore one in the spirit of gentleness. And the King James right here says meekness. Seek to restore that one because you'll have brothers and sisters that's in this battle. You'll have brothers and sisters that's in this fight, living this life for Christ, that they may get beat up by the enemy. They may got caught. Their foot may got caught in sin, and, and they already down. And they feel bad. They feel convicted about it. But at the same time, we don't need to kick them while they're down, but we need to help them up. If they're truly repentant and sorry about it, we need to pick them up. And we need to help them. We need to, we need to show them where they made that mistake. But we need to be restorers. Amen? We need to restore them. Now, if they think that they can just flaunt their sin and live however they want to and just thumb their nose in the face of God, then that's another thing. Then they need to be rebuked. Amen? Amen. But we don't kick our brothers and sisters in Christ when they're down. But... You have some preachers that say today you can't mention the word sin. When it says in the Bible here, sin, sinneth, sinning, sinner. Sin doesn't give you an inferiority complex, as Robert Schuller says. No. What sin does, hallelujah, it, it sin, what it does, it, it will destroy you. The wages of sin is death. death. But Jesus said in John 10, 10, he says, I've come. Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I come that they may have life and that more abundantly. Abundant life. And you can be Christians walking this walk with God, living for Him the best you know how to, but, you, but at the same time, you, you are not experiencing the abundant life that Christ died and paid the sacrifice for you to already have. But you're forfeiting that abundant life. Why? Because you keep getting whooped up in different areas of your life. And he's paid such a price. If you just keep your faith in him, now he can do what he wants. But if you don't rest in him. See, when, you tr when we try to do it our way, when we try to grow and mature and bear fruit in our own strength and ability, then what we're doing it is doing it our way and not God's way. Amen. And that's where we always mess up. That's where we always stumble. And that's where we always fail. Then we find ourselves doing that same thing again. Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I won't do that again. Do it again. Why? Because we're looking at everything else except for Christ, that finished work. When he said it is finished, let go and let God. Let him do what he wants to do. Let him have his way in you. There's a difference between a struggling Christian and an unsaved person. And the reason why, Christians will sin at times. But they don't live a life in sin. Christians live apart now from sin because they're saved by the blood of Jesus. That's been atoned for at the cross. There's no such thing. Think about this. And, and it, sounds, it sounds correct. But, but think about this. When he says we are sinners saved by grace. If I'm a sinner, then I'm not a saint. If I'm a saint, then I'm not a sinner, though I'm capable of sinning as a Christian. That's why 1 John 1, 9 pertains to the Christian, not the sinner. That if we what? If we confess our what? We confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Research that out. That's for the Christian, not, not for the unbeliever. Now, Christians, as I said, will sin sometimes while yet hating sin, the sin that enslaves and binds them. While at the same time they hate it. Why? Because they who want they are people who want deliverance. And they truly cry out, those who truly cry out for freedom. A true person who's saved, they don't want to be bound by the enemy. They don't they don't want to. It's just like an anaconda choking the very life out of you, strangling the life out of you. 
But God wants you to live free. He's already died to set you free, but you have to walk in it. Amen? And how we walk in it again goes back to where our faith is. Is your faith in Him? Are you resting? That word rest. Are you resting in what Christ done, Christian? Are you resting in what He's done? Because if you're resting in what He's done, we're exhibiting and showcasing our faith in what He's done for us at Calvary to destroy the power of sin that rules and dominates in our lives. That's why the Word also says, it says, Be not entangled again. Again. Don't go back. Don't be entangled again. Don't revert back. Be not entangled again. He died to set you free, and there you go, put yourself right back in that spiritual incarceration cell. Don't go back again and be entangled by the yoke of bondage which brings slavery. Say, don't go back. Don't, go back. don't, revert, back. don't revert back. Thank you, Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 and 2 says, There therefore now is no what? Condemnation, Condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. spirit. We don't throw our children away when they mess up and make a mistake, do we? We may discipline them. They may have to pay the consequence, but we don't write them off and have nothing to do with them no more. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Yes, we, we, we will sin sometimes. We may think something that's wrong, or, or why did I think that towards him? I, that was a hateful thought, I thought. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me what I thought. Just an example. Just an example. We have to ask God to forgive us. Because why? We have, to, we have to be right before God. We want our hearts to be right before God. And the Bible says to examine yourself to see if you be in the faith. Examine yourselves. Examine yourself. Say, say examine. examine. Sinners practice sin and can care less about living holy because they are obligated to live sinfully. And they are slaves to sin. They don't care. Sinners don't care about living righteously. They're not obligated because the Spirit of God doesn't abide or reside within them. They can care less. But we should have a pure hate for sin. We should have a pure hate for sin. We should love the things that God loves and hate the things that He hates. Amen? We should... But why, why? See, sometimes we think that it's okay to participate in certain aspects of what this world has to offer. See, sometimes when you watch certain things, even as a Christian, you become desensitized and you think certain things you look at is okay, which God is vehemently opposed to with his face and his nostrils. But see, that's why we have to come up to his level and see where he sees things at. Amen? For his thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so is his thoughts above our thoughts, and his ways are above our ways. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 and 9. We have to see through his perspective and see how he feels about certain things. We have to have a, a healthy hate for sin. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 says, Woe unto them who call good evil and evil good. Woe unto those who call good evil and evil good. Look at 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. The reason why we have so many abortions, the reason why we have so many murders, the reason why young kids will cuss adults out and have no respect for the elders is because of sin. The reason why we have all the calamities and everything we have going on on this earth is because of sin. Because of one man's sin entered the whole earth. <coughs> Jesus Christ is the answer for sin. Amen. His precious blood. The answer is not in our national leaders. The answer is not in your 401k. The answer is not in education. The answer is in Jesus Christ. The answer is not in your spouse. The answer is in the Word of God. Hallelujah. The reason, the cause, root problem is sin, but the answer and the remedy is the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? 1 John chapter 2.
Verse 1 through 6. Go ahead and read that for me, my brother. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this we know that we know him, if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. Amen. Is that the word? Or is that our words? Is it the word? If it's the word, say amen. Amen. It says that verse 1, just echoing what he said. These things I write unto you, that you sin not. And is that referring to sinless perfection, or that you don't practice the lifestyle of sin as Christians? Right. That you practice the lifestyle of sin. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Who, who, who is that? What does it say? Jesus, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is our advocate. Verse 2, and why is that? Why? Verse 2, what it says, he is a propitiation. That means what? Covering. Atonement. For our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. So thank God, he's a covering. Amen. When we, when we sin as Christians, the blood of Jesus, Jesus covers that. When we ask him to forgive us. But he's also for the whole world if they will accept him as their Lord and Savior. Amen? Now verse 3, it says, And hereby we know that we know Him, we know that we know Him, if we keep His commandments. But in, our, in your own strength, can you keep His commandments? No. Because in your own strength, if you try to keep His commandments, in your own ability and in your own strength, you're going to fail and stumble every time. But when you keep your faith, and what Christ done on that cross, now the Holy Spirit can do what he wants to because you're resting in what he's done. If he says, son, I got it. Daughter, I got it. Then we trust him. We take what he says to the bank and we rely and we rest in, in the working in the, of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we keep our faith in what he's done on that cross when he says, it is finished. It was on that cross where he said, it is finished. He destroyed the power of the sin nature that once ruled and dominated in our lives. Where at one time it would take you nothing to, to, to do things that gratify and satisfy the flesh. But because you placed your faith in Christ and now the Holy Spirit lives and abides within you. Now you want to live holy and live upright before God. You get convicted when you sin against God. You get convicted as Christians when you do wrong in the sight of God. Because we want to stay right before Him. Verse 5, but whoso keepeth his word in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby we know we that we are in him. Look at 1 John chapter 3. Just go over to chapter 3, verse 5 through 9. 1 John chapter 3, verse 5 through 9. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. There it is again. Sinneth not. In other words, what? You don't habitually, intentionally, willfully practice a lifestyle of sin. Reading on. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. That's pretty strong, ain't it? Little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Thank God he came and died on that cross to destroy the works of the enemy. Verse 9, whosoever is 
born of God, amen, does not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him. What is that? That seed. The Holy Spirit abideth within him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. He is born again. The Holy Spirit lives within him. Praise the Lord. He has no desire to practice sin. She has no desire to practice sin because they're children of the Most High God. Verse 10. In this the children of God are manifested and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God. Neither he that loveth not his brother. Now some things that can kill and destroy, when we, when we say sin in a camp, see Eli didn't deal with that sin. He allowed, he, he spoke to his sons and yet he was passive about it, but he didn't get right to the root. And therefore his sins continued, uh, the sins of his uh, sons continued on and continued on. And because he didn't deal with them, then things wax worse. It's just like trying to put a patch over some type of tear instead of stitching it up. And what happens is it gets worse. And because you don't properly address and deal with sin in the church, in your personal life, then it just only gets worse and worse and worse. Some things in the church that can kill the church if the man of God, if leadership doesn't deal with things like confusion. Dealing with confusion. Because God is not the author of confusion. And, and Eli should have dealt with his sons immediately. And if they would not turn, if they would not hearken, if they, would, they were supposed to hearken, but since they did not, then he dealt with them. He should have. But what happened? They continued on. And as as men of God, as leaders in the church, you have to deal with confusion. You have to deal with lies. You have to deal with gossip and all these different things that can hurt the church body. I'm not talking about there's some information that needs to be known that leaders need to be made aware of so we can pray or whatever. But I'm talking about for the sake of tearing one another down and just putting their business out there. See, we, we are to keep unity in the body. We are to keep unity in the house of God. And not only that, you're supposed to be able to rule your house. Amen? Eli couldn't rule his house. He was a priest of the, of the living God. And he, he refused to rule his house and discipline them, his sons. False doctrine. Leading people away. That's inviting sin and false doctrine. Leading people away from God. Leading people away from the cross. And, and pointing them towards another God. Pointing them towards idolatry. Pointing them towards sin. Causing God's people to sin and stumble. When we pull them away from the cross. We pull them and lead them towards sin and towards unrighteousness. Because sin begat sin begat sin. And it brings in nothing but demon spirits. It brings in confusion. And, in every, and, and therefore, when sin is allowed and it's not dealt with, the devil has every right to destroy and wreak havoc on your household, to wreak havoc in the church, to wreak havoc in any, any area of your life if you don't get to the root of that. Y'all better hear me today, church. It's time to get right to the root of some things. Praise God. Because, see, God is calling us now. The Lord is coming back. He's coming back for a church that wants to get right. He's coming back for a church that will be right without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Amen? Do I have any witnesses in here? Amen. Say, Lord, help me to be right. Lord, me Do you right. want to be ready? Yes. Do you want to be ready? Yes. Praise God. Because God wants us to be right before Him. He wants us to live holy before Him. Amen? I don't want nothing in between me and God. And see, David, David, think about this. David couldn't have a restoration in his relationship with God until repentance came. Because when he looked at Bathsheba, and when he tried, when he looked upon her, instead he entertained what he saw and entertained those desires, therefore. Amen? And what happened? He ended up committing what? Adultery with her? And then he tried to put uh, Uriah, her, her husband, on the front line to cover his sins. And when you try to lie and cover your sins instead of owning up, then sin begets another sin. Lie covers another lie because you won't come clean with God. 
God wants you to come clean with Him. You can't hide from Him. He sees you. He knows what's going on behind closed doors. He knows the whole deal. But you have to be real with God. Own up to Him. Own up to it. We have to deal with that Jezebel spirit in the house that will try to come and tear apart. There was this one, uh, two pre preachers who I knew, and this one lady, she went into both of these churches, and she will come and try to bring division against the husband and the wife, then try to bring division against the pastor and his wife. And what happened? They warned her. True story. They warned her twice. They put her out the third time because she refused to stop. She was still causing division. She it went over to the next church. Another preacher told me, do you know so-and-so? I said, oh, yeah, I do. I know, I know of her. I don't know her, but I do know of her. Same thing. Putting people against each other. Bringing division. <laughs> causing confusion. And he had to put an end to that divisive, manipulative, wicked spirit. That Jezebel spirit. In every aspect. See, Jezebel, when you think about Jezebel spirit, it's not just sexual. But if you think about that, I mean, wow. Deceitful, liar, wicked, evil, manipulative. The, the list goes on and on. Seductive. Sin left unaddressed will destroy. Don't leave an open door for the enemy. Don't allow the devil to get in, to get in the car with you and become the passenger because pretty soon he'll become the driver. Don't you play with the devil. Don't give the devil an inch because he will take a mile. Amen. Go with me to uh, Ephesians. Let me tell you something, church. You can't allow. There's some things that you can't allow or some people that you can't allow to be in your life that will pull you away from God. They will pull you away from the things of God. They will pull you backwards. Some people that will try to get you to do wrong and to live opposite or contrary to what the Word of God says. 2 Corinthians, before we read that, 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Be not unevenly yoked with unbelievers. Be not unevenly yoked with unbelievers. You'll have some people that, you know, we are in this world, but we're not of this world. So he calls us to be separated. But some people who you rub every day, elbows and shoulders with, if they're not walking the same direction you're walking, they can pull you away from God and not to God. Because two of you have two different motives, two different agendas. And it's easier for the person on the bottom of the stairs to pull you down off of your base than for you to pull them up. People in your life that will try to get you to sin against God, you have to choose. Is it them or is it the Lord? Is it my relationship with God? Who do I put first? Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 7. Amen. And it says this. Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. But fornication, this is that sex outside of marriage, and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints, Neither filthiness, nor foolishness, or nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no whoremonger, no unclean person, no covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Don't, partic don't participate, y'all. Don't throw in your lot with them. Don't, don't engage in sin. Don't associate and rub shoulders with people who are deep off into sin. Why? Have you heard of that term, guilt by association? Who are your everyday uh, running partners? You might as well be labeled with what, what they are, even though you don't live their life, because those are your everyday partners. 
Yes, we, we, are, we are to win them to Christ and bring them around, but we hang out with people like that on our terms, not on theirs. Invite them to functions, invite them to things. Amen. But but let's let's go back to let's close this out. First Samuel chapter four. First Samuel chapter four. What happened to Eli, Hophni, and Phineas? Because they didn't repent, because they didn't get right, because they didn't get on their face before God. God has a time frame for each and every one of us. Some is different than others. Sometimes God will allow things to happen to you to give you a wake-up call. Almost died twice in a car wreck. Almost died twice. Twice in less than a month because of living in sin. This was over 16 years ago. Living in sin. Living apart from God. Doing what I wanted to do. Almost lost my life in another car accident. Steel. Car rolled over three times. Landed on all four tires. Still hard headed. Still unrepentant. Still doing what I wanted to do. What does God have to do? What does He have to do? How does He have to shake you up for you to get right? What does he have? What has to happen for you to get right and, and, and to serve him? What does it take? 1 Samuel chapter 4. Let's read verse 10. 1 Samuel chapter 4. Look at verse 10. So what happened here is when the Philistines went up against Israel, before we read, the Philistines had went up against the Israelites. And because Israel was in disobedience, see, God has given them victory after victory after victory. Whenever they served God, God gave them the victory in battle. Whenever they disobeyed God and lived how they wanted to live, then and serve and did just as the other sinful and wicked nations did, then when they went into battle, they would lose. So they thought that they were going to have victory today because they thought that God, was, as he was with them before, he would be with them today. But they, as a nation, was living in sin. And they thought just because they had the Ark of God right there. See, think about this, though. On, on, on the, the, Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, when they carried it into battle, the two priests would carry it before the soldiers. And that was represented where the... The presence of God abode in the middle. But the presence of God wasn't with them in that battle to get them that victory because of their sin. And God will not tolerate for after a while, he won't keep and continue to allow sin to abide and dwell. His presence will uproot and move. This is why. Read this. 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled, every man into his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with the clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came low, Eli sat upon a, a head, or, I'm sorry, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all of the city cried out. And when Eli heard the noise, of the, of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim, that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, what is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been a great slaughter among the people. And thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell 
from off the seat backwards by the side of the gate, and his neck brake, and he died. For he was a very old man and heavy, and his and he has judged Israel forty years. Forty years. Forty years. Forty years, people. God gives you X amount of time. He gives you so much time to deal with things in the house. And if you don't deal with it, then He will. There are some things He's calling us to deal with, and if we don't deal with us, He'll deal with us. I know this is a hard word, people. But sometimes we need that. In the last three verses it says, And his daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed. For her pains came upon her, and about the time of her death, the woman that stood beside her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory of is departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel for the ark of God is taken. When we continue to allow things in our lives that will bring shame, that will allow, when we allow sin in our lives, when we allow these things in, if we don't deal with them, if we bring in false teachings and anything that's contrary to the Word of God, and we don't address the situation, then how long will it be before God takes His hand up off that ministry? Before God takes His hand up off our life? Before God says, enough with you? His Spirit will not continuously keep striving with us, with man. After so long, He'll say, okay, They've gone too far. They have a seared conscience. They won't do right before me. They're not going to repent. They're not going to live right. They're going to think that they can live however they want to and still expect to benefit greatly from it. God will not continuously keep striving and pulling and plucking at your heart to get it under the blood, to repent, to be right. There's going to come a time where they'll just say, hey, I'm going to just step back. And I'm going to just let you be. I'm going to turn you over to Satan. He told this minister friend of mine he was bound by drugs, bound by alcohol. And, and, and he's been 20 years he's been away from the Lord. And on this day, he, he hallucinated so greatly, he just, he was out of it. And he was on his, almost, he was on his deathbed. He was in a hospital. And, and when he had left, when he had, he had died, it's like in his vision, he saw, he said he had stood before God. He was standing before the Lord. And he said to this gentleman, he said, he called him by name, and he said, I'm going to, if you don't repent now and give your life over to my son, I'm going to turn you over to him. And he was pointing and looking over there, and he said there was a devil. I'm going to turn you over to him. But his body was revived from them trying to revive him from these drugs. And then he, 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 when he came back to, when he was, re, when he recovered, when they brought him back to life, when they brought him back to, he had, I mean, he got so scared that he repented. And, and he, he said, Lord, forgive me, save me, be the head of my life. Lord, I turn from it. I mean, that was enough for him. And he's been running forward. Because the reality of hell is real. Heaven is real, but hell is hot. I just, I love you because I say those things because I want you to, to keep you on the right path before God. Don't be like Eli. Don't play with sin and get burnt. Let's stand and bow our heads. And let's close our eyes, church. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.